If you hear screaming or a baby crying coming from the woods, whatever you do, don't follow it. That's what they first told me when I moved to a rural town about two years ago, and I probably retold it a dozen times to people who have visited me since. I'm finally turning to the internet to tell my experiences and see if any of you have had some similar to mine. It's not just crying though. It also involves voices that call you by name, asking you to come to them. As of now, I'm not too scared to hear random crying or voices coming from the mountains, because I've heard them so many times. There are certain sounds that come from the wilderness that scare me to death, however because they usually signal of something bad to happen. Such as the one time where we heard a louder than usual chilling cry mixed with screams randomly throughout the day. And that same night, there were two goats on one of the farms that were found mutilated and torn to pieces at the edge of the woods. There were separate occasions of this same sounding cry, and similar things had occurred. There are only about 10 families that live in this area, and they are a tight-knit community. So, when I first moved in two years ago, they tended to not like me, but have grown to accept me. They mainly don't like new people moving into the area, or tourists stopping by because that usually causes the crying from the woods to grow louder. Or the tourists end up going missing because they didn't listen to us when we told them not to follow the sounds. We rarely get tourists now compared to when I first moved here. And since so many people have gone missing in the past, the government has blocked off the forest with a large fence about a year ago. It's still public land that you can go into, but they put up the fence to try and dissuade people from doing so. The search and rescue has also put up warning signs saying, Dangerous, enter at your own risk. And they never specified why, and I'm never going to tell you guys where my town is located because I know people are going to be stupid enough to try and test the story out. I'm posting these stories here because I want to see if anyone else out there is experiencing the same thing where they live, or if it's just exclusive to my town. The first week that I moved into this area was probably one of the scariest experiences of my life, because I wasn't used to the random crying that came from the forest. When I heard a baby crying out in the woods on the second day when I was loading furniture into my new house, I didn't know what to think. It was the first time that I had ever experienced it, and the people in town already had told me not to follow it and to just ignore them. When they first told me, I was in disbelief of this, and probably thought that it was the wind brushing through the trees or something like that that was making the sound. So, when I heard the crying of a newborn that sounded so realistic, to even the sounds of a breathing between lines could be heard echoing from the woods, I had no idea what I should do. My natural instincts were to go see what was wrong, and if there was any way that I could help. But what if what the people in town were saying was right, and that I should never follow it? I decided that I wasn't going to follow it too far, just hoping that I would be able to see whatever was making the noise. I started walking towards the trees and got close to the tree line. As I did, a hand reached out and grabbed my arm firmly. It was one of my neighbors that was helping me move all my things in, and I'll say his name is Manuel to keep his identity safe. He then told me, I knew you were going to try that at one point. What if there's someone over there that needs our help? I asked as I pulled my arm away. Look here. No one in this town knows what makes those sounds and everyone that finds out, die. Don't go over there. Simple as that. He replied to me as he tapped me on the shoulder, and they continued to carry boxes into my house. I tried to ask him more questions about it, but he was always hesitant to talk about it, and avoided the conversation the best that he could. He finally got annoyed by my constant pestering that he responded saying, I've told you everything you need to know about those sounds. Whatever or wherever they come from can hear what we are saying. And supposedly, if you think or talk about it too much, you'll be driven mad as that allows it to access your thoughts. I stopped asking him questions after that, and we now get along great together. 
The main thing that I got from what he said was that as long as you follow the main rule of not following them, you'll be fine. There are rare occasions, however, like with the goats that have died where the thing comes out of the forest. Very few while I've lived here have gone missing, but I've heard of many stories from the townspeople of hikers who have never come back and even people from search and rescue that have gone missing. It makes sense why the Forest Service put up the sign saying, Dangerous, enter at your own risk, on the fence. Because, how are you supposed to try and find someone out there when there is a random crying and even voices calling us by a name from the woods? I have a particular story that comes the closest to describing whatever is out there, and it came from someone from search and rescue that made it out. It's the closest thing we have to a description of what it looks like, but I'll save that for another time. Due to that, I don't want to have my thoughts be thinking about that thing for an extended period of time, and you know why. I will finish this request in that, if you ever do hear people calling you from the woods or a baby crying, even if they sound like family, don't follow them. Always be aware of people that are around you because the thing in the woods making the sound is often known to imitate the same voices of loved ones. I will say again one more time to ingrain it into your skull. Just ignore them and act like nothing is wrong. Since the last time that I uploaded the first part of the story, I had gotten a few comments and replies of people telling me what the noises could be caused by, and the top two were SCP-939 with its nickname being, with many voices. And for those who don't know what an SCP is, it's a supposed thing that needs to be secured, and then contained and lastly protected thus the nickname of SCP, because they are highly dangerous. The other one was that skinwalkers are also able to imitate human voices, and trick people by luring them with a loved one's voice. However, it is said that only extremely skilled skinwalkers are able to do this, that means it's very rare to come across this trait in them. And so, most encounters just describe seeing them, but never actually hearing loved ones' voices coming from it. I would like to thank you all for your concerns and interest in what I have to say. But I must warn you ahead of time. Do not think about this thing for an extended period of time. Or else, it'll drive you mad. To actually write all of this out for you, I have to take about 30 minute breaks for every 20 minutes I'm able to write. If I try to push past those 20 minutes, then random images flash through my head of myself dying in gruesome ways. So I beg you that when you finish reading this, please go listen to music or watch your favorite TV show, but whatever you do, do not keep thinking about it. After writing the first post of this, I found random scratches in the back of my house and have heard eerie knocking on my window during the night. I never go investigate, but just rather sleep through them. However, it's worth the risk of that thing coming to get me because the local government has tried to cover it up, but I think everyone should be warned not to follow those sounds. Anyway, I'm going to tell you of a story that I first heard when I came to town from one of the families here who I'll call the Jeffreys. So, one evening, they were having a barbecue in their backyard, and there were about six of them all together. They had two children, with the younger one being only a year old, while the other one was around five. It was later in the evening when the five-year-old went looking for cool-shaped rocks, as in the words of the boy. So while he's doing this, the five-year-old's mother is keeping an eye on him, but the one-year-old baby begins to cry, who is being held by her father-in-law. So, she quickly rushes over to help her baby, and forgets about the five-year-old who is now ever so slowly wandering away. That's when they hear the voices whisper from the woods, calling out to the boy saying something similar to this in a child's voice. Johnny, come play with me. I have plenty of cool rocks for you over here. The boy's father jumped up as he heard this faint whisper, and immediately screams for his son to come back. The thing then copies the father's voice yelling the exact same phrase. Johnny, come back. Don't follow the voice. At this point, everyone is freaking out looking for the boy, but staying relatively close so no one else would end up missing. They heard crying, but no one knew what to do because they knew the rule of never following it, 
but their child was now lost and they had no other choice. So the father of the boy runs inside and comes back out with a 12 gauge shotgun. So they follow the cries behind him as they edge closer to the woods calling out for the boy. As they get closer, they come upon a tree where it seems the crying is coming from. The father takes the lead and jumps to the other side of it to find his son huddled up grabbing the tree for dear life. Johnny opened his trembling mouth muttering, Dad, there's something over there calling for me. I can still see it. The father swiftly turned his head to where his son was looking but saw nothing out of place. Here son, let's take you back to the house. You'll be safe there. The father said as he handed his shotgun to his own father and he picked up his son. Dad, it's following us. Johnny said as he squeezed his father's arms tightly. Don't look at it. Just tell me about your favorite food. The father replied in a worried but loving manner. It looks like mommy. Johnny stated quietly, and this sent shivers down his father's spine. And everybody heard what he was saying, but every time they looked back to see it, nothing was there. They all went inside after that, and haven't had a barbecue outside since. They were also the few ones to actually raise children here due to how dangerous it is to have them wandering about. Their children, even though they were born out here in the country, have been stuck in their house for nearly their entire lives. It's sad, but I understand why they must take that precaution because kids are so innocent and trusting. So when a voice that sounds like their mother's or a friend is calling for them, they will most likely listen to it and follow it. Nearly the same thing happened with my sister who has one child when she came to visit us. She didn't believe me at first when I told her about the voices and the crying that resonates in the woods. It also meant that she was letting her 7 year old run around everywhere without watching him. She wasn't used to have to constantly keep an eye on him and so he nearly ran off after the voice of another little boy who kept calling for him to play with him. Her son came indoors and asked for permission and in his own words said, Can I play with the boy that lives in the woods? As soon as my sister heard this, her eyes grew wide and she realized what I was saying was right. She left that same night. I never invite my family to come to my house anymore because when I do, that thing will mimic their voices afterwards. It can only mimic the voices of people that it has heard, so after my sister left my house, it kept beckoning me in her voice to come and help her find her way out of the woods. And like always, I ignore it. But this might backfire in the future if my sister ever did need my help because I would instinctively ignore it. That's all I can write for now, but if anyone is able to exactly explain to me what this thing is, then I will gladly accept it. That's why I'm telling you as many traits of it as I can. But I must stop writing now because the images of me dying are once again popping into my head. Until we meet again, stay safe out there. Last night, I heard laughing coming from outside and I'm not even joking. There was literally something chuckling like a crazed maniac on the other side of the wall. And I awoke with my blood pumping so hard that I felt like my veins were about to burst. I have never heard this before for the two years that I've lived here, but I've been told the stories about it. Supposedly, when the thing begins laughing, which is extremely rare, and the last time it happened was when someone was taken from their house in the middle of the night. That person was a 70 year old woman that had lived here most of her life. Her children had all moved away by then and her spouse had kicked the bucket four years prior. So, she was by herself which is the same case I'm in right now. Also, guess what the police report said? It stated that she died of natural causes. There is nothing natural about being strung up in a tree and gutted like a fish. That's how the people from town explained it to me. And they were very close to her, so when they heard about the cover-up, they went to complain about it. They were then told that if they really wanted to get the press involved, then they would have to lose all of their homes and land because the government would declare it an unsafe land to live on. So they backed down. Anyway, when I checked my house this morning, 
I found the kitchen window wide open, and the lock to it was crushed to pieces. There was no way for me to keep it shut, so I had to resort to duct tape, which made me look more like white trash than I already am. I looked at the back of my house where I found the scratching previously, but nothing had changed since the day before, except for the pine needles being all stirred up. I decided to follow where it looked like something had dragged their legs through the needles and it led to my window. I looked through it and there was a small crack in the blinds which allowed a perfect view of my pillow where I rest my head at night. My hands trembled when I realized that something was watching me as I slept. But I don't know if it was just some crazed lunatic or if it was the thing from the woods. Some of you have commented that I should move away and I was thinking that it was a drastic decision and not worth doing but after last night, I feel like I may have no other choice if I want to live. I ended up talking to my friend Manuel about everything and he responded by saying, You have to stop writing about that thing. It doesn't like to be explained to anyone or anything. That's why that old woman went missing a while back, because she kept telling her children about these strange occurrences of the voice after they had moved away and then her children would tell people they would know, and so on and so forth. But I think everyone should understand not to follow that voice or any others in the woods, because there has to be more than just one out there, I replied. That's exactly why it's trying to stop you from doing that. It doesn't want to be understood because then it loses its power of luring people to it. Manuel said as he observed the damage to my house, If I were you, I would delete those posts and stay off the internet for a week, and don't talk to anyone from out of town for a good while. Maybe that thing will forget about what you've done. Just hope your post doesn't become too popular because that would be a death sentence. Manuel finished talking as he took a coke from my fridge. I agreed with what he said at the time, but I feel like I have an obligation to warn as many people as possible about whatever it is. And now I'm going to add that if I end up not posting anytime soon, and then something happened to me, and who knows if I'll even make it through tonight. Please pray for me, no matter which god you believe in. I need all the help that I can get at this point. Before I end this post, however, I'm going to tell you the story that I heard from Manuel, about the search and rescue officer who made it out of the woods after losing one of his fellow officers. It was after that incident that they put up the signs and the fences, trying to keep people out of the forest. I will tell you this story with the best of my remembrance of the events that took place. The scenario they were called out to the woods was that a young woman who was a sophomore in college was on a road trip to see her family after the school year had ended, and decided to stop and go hiking along the way. Her car was parked along the road and was there for two days until it was reported by someone in the town. The police came to check it out and found that she had left her purse under the front seat and it had her driver's license and school ID in it. They contacted her parents who were worried sick because they had no idea where their daughter was. So, the police called a search and rescue out on the scene and they took off into the woods in the direction that the dogs caught her scent. They only sent two search and rescue officers to search for her, which is strange as if the people who sent them already knew it was a lost cause, and wanted to send people just to say that they tried their best. It was wrong and they ended up sending two rookies out on the scene, according to the officer who survived because, according to him, he had only been on two other searches for missing people before this. While they were having the dog follow her scent, and they were able to see some of her footprints in the dirt. This brightened up their spirits because they knew which direction they were headed in. However, as they continued on, they noticed that the footsteps began to become uneven and sink deeper into the ground, as if she was running. They looked around to see if she was chased by a predator, such as a bear, because they are also common in this area, but there were no other tracks shown. The ground was also not disturbed other than her footprints. The rescue officers were wondering what had caused her to run so frantically, and that's when the dog yanked on the leash as it barked at a nearby tree. They thought that they must be close due to the dog's reaction, but they called out and no one replied back except for a faint whimper. 
The whimpering slowly turned to a blood-curdling screaming, and the officers looked ahead and saw the woman on her hands and knees crying on the ground. The officer's partner ran forward to help her while he stayed back, held onto the dog that was still barking furiously at her. What's wrong, boy? You found her? The one officer said to the dog, as the dog's ears had dropped down, and out of nowhere, it yanks on the leash, which is loosely held by the rescue officer, allowing him to escape. The dog ran back to where they came from in a dead-out sprint. The officer called out for him to come back, and blew the dog whistle, but he never did. He soon gave up on trying to call him back. As he heard laughing, and as he turned his head, he noticed that the girl was now holding his colleague by the neck. Put him down! We're here to help you! The laughing only grew worse as he watched his colleague's face turn purple, before she looked at him with a big grin on her face. The officer just ran, leaving his partner behind while screaming on his radio that he needed backup, but no one ever responded. Behind him, he could hear the crunching and popping of breaking bones. He was able to escape luckily and got back to his search and rescue work truck. He drove like a madman out of there and no one believed his story. He lost his job because he had abandoned his partner, and his partner's body was never found. He told Manuel the story, and then Manuel told me. He told the people in this town because they were the only ones who took this story seriously, while the others would mock him and call him a coward. That description of it and the other story I told you earlier about the five-year-old boy who said he saw his mom looking back at him from the woods proves to me that this thing can do more than just mimic people's voices and cries. It can also shapeshift, which makes me believe it's either a skinwalker or something that's never been heard of before. Whatever it is though, it can kill. All I know is that it's getting into my head and ravaging my thoughts like a crazed animal consuming a carcass. Again, pray for me. I'm going to stay tonight at Manuel's house because I just don't feel safe in my own home. If I write again, then it means that I made it through the night. But if I don't, then consider this my last testament. It's been two days since I posted my last update, and I wish I could go back and delete this entire thing. It was a mistake to ever think about posting it. And I knew that there would be consequences from doing so, but I thought that they would have happened to me. I told you all that I was going to stay the night with Manuel, and I did. Trying to see if whatever it was would stay away because there was more than one person. But that was a grave mistake, and I would rather die than live with this guilt on my shoulders. When I went to Manuel's house, I slept on the couch because he's not used to guests, so he only has one bed and I'm not about to sleep beside him. He made me leave my laptop and phone back in my house because he wanted to try and keep that thing from coming after me the best that he could. His house was an old mobile home trailer that had been there so long that there was no way it could have been moved again without some major repairs. Anyway, we hung out and I felt like a high schooler again as we watched movies and we ate junk food. I dozed off to sleep during one of the later movies and Manuel left me on the couch as he went to sleep in his own bed. Hours go by and I soon can hear something very lightly brushing the side of the trailer house. My head bobbed up from the couch and I swiftly grabbed a kitchen knife and slowly gazed out of the window. In the darkness, I saw two yellow eyes stare at me. My heart kicked into overdrive as it came closer to the mobile home and its eyes seemed to drop with every step until whatever it was stepped into the light that Manuel had left on outside. It was just a cat, and it blew a sigh of relief until I remembered that no one had a cat that lived in the town, at least not since the old woman had died, and her cat was found hairless on the floor in her home that she was dragged out of, as if something had skinned it. I kept my eyes on the cat while trying my best to avoid his gaze. Just barely peeking through the side of the window, I saw the cat's skin begin to tear apart as it grew larger in size and indescribable hideousness. The skin was ragged and torn and it was no longer a cat but an eerie looking man hunched over on all fours. I watched in horror as he crawled to Manuel's bedroom window and it sounded like it was clacking its teeth together. 
I jumped back from the window and its head darted to where I was watching it from. I wanted to warn Manuel, but I felt like if I did, we would both die. So, I ran to a nearby closet, and I hid in the back of it covering myself with the jackets and shirts that dangled down from their hangers. From outside, I could hear it breaking the lock to the window, probably the same way that it broke mine. Soon, I heard the creak of the window as it slowly opened, and I was trying my best to not think about it. I tried to think about family members, friends, and my old high school days, as its crawling creaked the old, fake wooden floor. I could hear it edge closer to where I was, with it sniffing and the occasional snort. It started to make a sound from the back of its throat that sounded like nothing I had ever heard before and since. My body shook due to how aggressive the sound waves coming from it were. The closet door began to slowly creak open, and I was on the verge of crying wishing that I never wrote those posts. It started to inhumanly chuckle as it could sense my fear, while its disfigured hand grabbed my ankle with such a powerful grip, my bone felt like it could snap at any moment. It was then that Manuel slammed open his bedroom door with a rifle in his hand. Go back to where you came from. He screamed as he fired off rounds into the side of it. It let go of my ankle as its head twisted around 360 degrees to where Manuel stood at his bedroom door. It sat there gazing at him as he fired shot after shot into it but it never moved. Manuel soon ran out of ammunition and the thing just sat there staring him down. It was as if they were having a staring contest. Manuel started to turn around to grab his handheld pistol, and that's when it pounced on him with such swiftness it was as if it teleported. Run! Forget me! Manuel screamed at me as the thing began to dig its fingers into Manuel's back as smooth as butter. I threw the knife at it as I ran for the door, but it seemed as if it didn't care for me anymore. As soon as I got out of the mobile home, I didn't know what to do so I hopped into my car and I started the engine, and I swerved onto the road driving as fast as I could until I saw the Jeffreys home off to the side, and I pulled up into their driveway screaming and calling for them to come out, but then remembered that they wouldn't respond to that so I banged on their door. Mr. Jeffrey opened it with one hand and held a shotgun in the other. I explained to him everything that went down and told him that we needed to go back and help Manuel. But he took his hand and he placed it on my shoulder and said somberly, It's no use. He's already gone by now. I didn't know how to respond because he was my best friend and if Mr. Jeffrey wasn't going to help me, I was going to save him all by myself. But when I got back to Manuel's mobile home, there was no sign of him or the beast. All that was left was a blood trail leading into the woods. I was about to follow it, but then thought that if I went and got myself killed, he would have died in vain for trying to save me. So, I just got back into my car and cried till the sun came up. All of the families gathered around Manuel's house because they heard everything that went on but never even tried to save him. We followed the trail of blood and drag marks to the edge of the woods, and my stomach twisted at the sight. And I never was one to cry, but after seeing him like that, I didn't know how to express my emotions. He was hanging from the tree by his intestines that were tied around the branch above. He was unrecognizable due to how his skin had been peeled off. That's as much detail that I want to put into this because tears are already landed on my keyboard. I never should have posted about this story even to warn others who will encounter the voices. But everything done is done and I have sealed Manuel's fate. I should have been the one hanging from the tree, not him. He paid for what I had done, and I've already moved away from that place that I used to live in. And that's why I haven't posted too much these last two days and after this, I will never post again because I still fear that thing will find me even if I'm 400 miles away from it. At least I found out what it is because I needed to know and you need to know that you should never mess around or be lured in by a skinwalker. I just fear the day that I will see Manuel at my front door because I know it's not going to be him.